Today I'm in Hollywood with my guest, a man responsible for the most famous film themes of the past 30 years. I could list them, but what's the point? When you hear them, it's obvious. Themes by the composer John Williams. It's impossible to imagine the emotional impact of Schindler's List or E.T. without that music. The adrenaline rush of Superman, Raiders of the Lost Ark or Star Wars, the terror of Jaws. A John Williams score is instantly recognisable. He's a master of manipulating audience mood. As you drive into Spielberg's DreamWorks compound in Hollywood's Universal City, you are indeed entering a sanctuary of low buildings in the style of a Mexican adobe settlement. Here, past the Jurassic Park-style security fence, around a cactus-filled courtyard, just down the hall from Spielberg's office, I met John Williams, who's worked with the director for more than 30 years. From Jaws in 1975 to Munich, which brought him an Oscar nomination this year. In fact, 2006 brought two Academy Award citations. The other was for Memoirs of a Geisha. And this brings Williams' total to 45, nudging record holder Walt Disney. John Williams rarely gives interviews. There can't be much time since he's still working six days a week at 74. When we met, he was creating a new score in the next room. He looks like a college professor, beard, glasses, and he does seem a shy man in contrast to his expansive, emotive music. It amazes me, 45 nominations, I didn't think anybody could be quite that old, still doing it, so to speak. My wife usually wears a black dress, and people say to her, Samantha, why do you always wear black to the Oscars? And she says, because we've lost so many times. Let's talk a bit about the collaboration that has brought you many of those nominations, which is with Steven Spielberg. And I wondered now, after all these years, whether there's a kind of shorthand between the two of you when a new project you know, comes along. Yes, it is true. Just as you, you say, it, it, one develops as in a good marriage after a number of years a working relationship that sort of gets to the point. You don't have to go through the opening overtures of getting to know each other. You've already done that, and you can get right to the work. And Stephen comes to my office, which is very close to where we're sitting here, and very close to his, in fact. And I play him themes on the piano, and that's as far as we take it. I don't work up synthesized replicas of what I'm going to do. He'll say, oh, that sounds fine. Or, or not, or let me hear another idea, and I very often have two or three suggestions for seeing. Let's go right back to the beginning, just as a, an idea of how that partnership started. If we go back to Jaws, to what extent did he talk to you about the kind of music that he wanted? I mean, music that has now become so famous. When I sat with Stephen at the piano, the way that I've described to you, and began to play an idea for Jaws, it was just two notes, and then eventually a third note played at the lower end of the piano, and he said, well, you really think that can work, something as simple as that, and as mindless as that is? And I can remember, I think, saying to him that when it's presented by the celli and basses of the orchestra, that it will have a very ominous and threatening kind of feeling to it. Also, it's the kind of that little tadam two note motif offered a lot of opportunity to accelerate it, speed it up, start it very slowly and quicken it, and also increase the volume. And 
what did yeah, what did you have in mind though? Because it's so it's so simple and it immediately invokes this feeling of dread. Is it it's it's a sort of animal sound, isn't it? Rather like a low that. roar or you know, it's so very interesting about it too. Now when I occasionally play it at a concert, it opens with one note, as you remember. And then two, ding, dong. And at a concert, when I play it now, I play the one note, and people giggle. <laughs> it's now, it's now funny. And I think I, in, initially I was trying to find something that was mindless, but powerful and unstoppable, like the animal itself. And then also, as as it, the attack becomes more frenzied, as we know that the shark is, is coming in, the, the the idea of panic that I suppose makes one think of things like psycho, the the idea of invoking that kind of frenzy, the panic. What is it that sets our nerves quite so on edge? I wish I knew. I mean, it, psycho, done by the late Bernard Herrmann, which is so. Well, your listeners will remember it. You know, it's it's in the case of psycho, it's only one note that he shrieks on the violin, you know, and does it so effectively. Somewhere uh, in, in the collective psyche, there's a panic button that certain musical effects or vo even vocal sounds that we might produce connect us with our centers of fear, our centers of need to escape, to fly, to panic and that uh, music apparently can do this. I'd like to jump right now to the other end, which is to Munich, which is a very recent score that we're seeing in, in cinemas now, because with films like Munich, or Schindler's List indeed, where the subject matter is extremely intense and recent and very powerful. It must sometimes be difficult composing to that. When I first saw the film Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg showed me the film. It had no music, and he showed it to me in his home, and the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the music of Schindler's List. And at the end of the screening, I was so moved People may remember it ended at the gravesite of Oscar Schindler with the survivors and, and their children putting stones on the grave. And the lights went up in the room, and I couldn't speak. I was so overcome with emotion. And just said to Steve, I, I just have to walk around the building for a few minutes, collect myself. And I did that, and I came back five or ten minutes later to begin our discussions about what to do with the music with Schindler's List. And I said to Mr. Spielberg, and meant it and didn't mean to be deprecating at all, I just said to him, Stephen, you, you need a better composer than I am for this film. And he said, I know, but they're all dead. Well, I'm interested, though, just to pick up, actually, on, on what Spielberg said to you there, because, I mean, you're very saying in a very self-deprecating way that suggesting that, you know, all the great composers... Mm -hmm. but, but actually, which are the composers, then, that you think would have that kind of power? I mean, what, who are the people you have in mind when you have a task as difficult as doing Schindler's List? Your question is an interesting one. If, if one looks at a film and says to oneself, what is the best composer in all of musical history for this film? It's a, fa it's a fascinating 
idea. And you think, wouldn't Wagner have been wonderful for so many films? And how many actually would Mozart really have been right for, even though he's perhaps arguably the greatest composer we ever had, or for me, maybe even Haydn, which will tell us also that there's, I think, a certain grammar that goes with... Film scoring is a very young art or craft. We've only been doing it for 70 or 80 or so years. And so we know a lot about its past, but I think what excites me more is the great future I think it's going to have, because we're all addicts now of visual stimulation from our computer screens and TV sets and movies and... I think whether we like it or not, the art of music and, and its future is inevitably linked, I think, with, the, with audiovisuals. We see that in the younger generations and they're, and they're wanting to, to look at something now also while they listen. You mentioned Wagner, and I wonder whether the, the whole Wagner thing of, of the leitmotif is something that you employ in film composition, particularly if you have a great epic like Star Wars, which has... A Wagnerian kind of dimension to it. Right. I, I think that, that the, uh, the leitmotivic practice, which is to say the technique of some kind of melodic identification with a character or a place, is basically how film music works. Using a leitmotif or a melodic identification with a character allows us, to, it admits repetition, so that you can hear a theme eight or ten times and you'll accept it. In a symphonic work, perhaps you wouldn't want, you, you'd want it developed or you'd want it varied in some way. But why repetition is good is because the viewer will see the film only once and he or she will be in mainly distracted by the visuals. And if the visuals are stunning enough, the more stunning they become visually, the more deaf we become. So we aren't engaged orally. And so the music needs to, needs to function in recognition of that fact. So simply put, in um, trying to create melodic identification, we can... We could present Darth Vader's theme, for example, and whenever we see him, or even perhaps when we want to, when we don't see him, but we want to be thinking about him, the orchestra would state his theme. Emotion, because I suppose, aside from opera, film is the most emotional of the arts in, in, in terms of, the, of what it actually stimulates within the audience. And nothing does that better than the music. And I wonder whether, you know, when you look back on your various schools, there are, I suppose we particularly think of E.T., perhaps, as, as a film where towards the end the emotion builds up to an almost unbearable amount. Now... Crudely, one might say, so this is to do with strings and you know huge orchestrations, but I'm sure it isn't. You tell me. I think so much goes into uh, uh, the effect of the delivery of a powerful emotion at the end of a film. Yes, strings will help. Yes, harmony will help in orchestration. But 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 what is so important is an hour and a half or ten reels of preparation for that moment. So. If you take E.T., for example, when E.T. goes over the moon and delivers this powerful punch musically, yes, it's strings, and yes, it's orchestra, but you may be able to say that the melody is, consists of 12 notes, and we're in the 12th reel. And the first reel, we only heard two notes. The third reel, we heard four. The fifth reel, we heard six manipulated to 10, so on. But in 12, you hear all 12 coming, so that the audience, you've created an expectancy to deliver something that's not only very emotional, but it's also inevitable. It's a moment that had to happen. Actually, Munich is an interesting contrast because Munich is obviously a very different kind of film. And a film, although it has 
a dramatic resolution does not have the set that same kind of emotional thing. If, if anything, it really leaves you with quite an unsettling ending. And I felt when I listened to the score, both watching the film and listening to the score afterwards, that there was something in the score that also gave you a feeling of almost reaching out for something that you weren't quite getting. At least for me, the challenge of finding just the right emotional note of not, so to, so to speak, overplaying it or underplaying it and delivering to the audience enough energy on the soundtrack, for one thing, just from a practical point of view. People are leaving the theater or they're adjusting themselves and so on. Uh, Munich leaves, leaves us all with a lot of perplexing questions about a situation that seems to be intractable and one of our most difficult problems. And perhaps one of the good things about the film is that it puts light on, on this agonizing and sometimes seemingly unsolvable problem. So and we have to try, to try to accompany that thought musically. I would say, just for the sake of this discussion, just at the spur of the moment, also not to, with a, to have a certain respect for the audience and not intrude on the moment of contemplation at the end of the film. <laughs> So take, take me through, if you would, the composing process. Obviously, you're working with the finished film by the time you start. The best way really is to be given the finished film. It doesn't always happen. But yes, if we can have the finished film and look at it and go through the film with the director usually and decide in the film where music is going to be helpful and perhaps just as importantly where we're not going to play, where the absence of it might create a, a better atmosphere or a greater expectation or whatever... And then I isolate each one of those and measure it out for the two or three or four minutes length and analyze the, the silhouette of that particular piece and go to the piano and write it. What ha I, I mean, I'm still very unreconstructed in the sense that I don't have computers and synthesizers. I work with a piano and a pencil and a piece of paper, which younger people find antediluvian. But I, I still do that. So you, you've, you've seen the finished film, you've written the score and then presumably you record a sort of simple version of that, what they call a guide track. Um, at that stage, do you still make modifications? How late do you make modifications? Well, the job of writing film scores is really, I say that it's a journalistic kind of a work in the sense that you write the music and it may be recorded the very next day and it's in print the day after that. And like most journalists, I think, in the world, they would pick up the, what they've written two weeks later, look at it and say, God, the prose is terrible. I could have done so much better if I could have reviewed this and had a chance, the opportunity to review it. And that's really the case with film music. What I think most contemporary composers are able to do is to, on their computers, synthesizers or pianos or whatever, they can make what we would call a guide track, of, which is sort of like a demonstration track of what they're going to do. And Unfortunately, the people that work with me get used to the idea that I'm just I'm so unreconstructed that I'm still going from the pencil phase to the orchestra phase, and I don't have the capacity to do the synthesized workup that many of my younger colleagues are able to do. I remember recently one of the Harry Potter films, uh, the director Alfonso Cuarón, who's, who's, who did a wonderful job, I think, on the second or third Harry Potter film, came to see me at the studio. He said, well, can I hear the synthesized track? And I said, well, Alfonso, I haven't got it since I can play it for you on the piano. Uh, but well, could you do it? I said, well, it would take weeks to do that. So in my case, the recording of music with the orchestra comes very quickly after the moment that I've written it.
occasionally I'll get an opportunity to, to revisit a scene, but not very often. And it usually is the result of, of the director, and in most of the cases with me, Steven Spielberg, who will say, maybe you could do this scene that you've done this morning in a different way, or maybe it could be better, or we might think about rewriting it. And, and in every score, I think there's a scene or two or three that, that I have an opportunity to rewrite, which I incidentally never mind doing, because like, a, like the journalist, you can look at that and, and go back to the piano and study and usually improve it. And that's a luxury that comes really mostly associated with big budget films that can actually afford a third or fourth day with the orchestra down the line next week when we can review some of these things. You're clearly working to fairly tight deadlines mm -hmm. on all of this. You know, do you ever have a moment where you think, I just don't know how I'm going to get out of this? <laughs> well, other people could call it, they would call it writer's block. Actually, no. I mean, I, I, uh, very early on in my working life in television, particularly in television where one had to really turn around scores very quickly, you had to get over the idea that, that what, you'd ha what you'd written had to be the end of the world because it was in print before you mm. could worry too much about it. A big factor in a job as demanding as this is good health. Feeling well enough to sit at a writing desk for six and eight or ten hours a day and, and, and not one day but five and six days a week. And just to give you an example, in the recent Star Wars film, the opening of the film had a 17-minute battle. That's 17 minutes of orchestral music in a battle mode, you know, to begin with. And that's the first week or two of the composing schedule. So. There isn't much room for writer's block. There could be room for, <laughs> always room for improvement, but no time for blocks. Now, you were classically trained and you're also a classical composer, aside from the film music, you know, the, the concerti and the symphonies. And I wonder if you feel that there is a, that you have a style that runs through both kinds of work. People, okay, uh, I, ask me if I have a style. I don't really know if I do. I, I think probably not. Um, in working on film, what I've always tried to do is try to provide the music that would live in that particular film that belong to the skeletal structure, the ta fabric and the, the atmosphere of, of that particular film. So the pr in the process of doing, I don't know how many films I've done in my life, 100 or 80 or 90, I don't, really don't know, I've, I've done a lot of these turns, these sort of swirling turns stylistically in an effort not to find my style or to find my voice, but to, to accompany the film in, an, in, the, in the intimate, organically connected way that the, the music for that film seemed to me, to my ear, to need. I know your um, friend Andre Previn, the, the composer and conductor, said, and I don't know whether he said this entirely seriously or whether his tongue was in his cheek at the same time, that he felt he wished that you did more classical music. You didn't spend so much of your time writing oh. film scores because he wanted to do more kind of serious music. <laughs> I mean, do you think he was joking or, or maybe do you have a slight feeling about that yourself? Andre, is, it's true. He's always chided me for doing so much film work and that I should be doing other things. Yeah, I think he was fairly serious about it and... Um, I don't know whether he, if had I done that, whether he would be thankful or not. Uh, <laughs> he might have given more approval to my film scores than the, than the other material. I don't know, but I, I think I think it was a, it was a, um, a genuine thing on Andre's part. I suppose and this may you may say this is something that, that you shouldn't comment on, but I wonder, you know, having composed the Star Wars music, which is the best-selling soundtrack of all time. Having music that is so recognisable that people know even within the first couple of bars or even the first couple of notes exactly what it is. I mean, what do you think that you have contributed in terms of sound to late 20th century, early 21st century <laughs> music? I mean, there's obviously, there's obviously, we've talked a little bit about the strings, but there's that trumpet melody as well. There's something that, you know, you know that's a John Williams mm. score. I think if you play the music of Star Wars once for people and they will never hear it again, they, they, they wouldn't have the recollection of it that they do have. I think that media and, and the distribution and dissemination of all this music is, is part of it. I would also say that 
in in the composition of, of anything that I do or anyone else does, I don't think you can ever ultimately measure the, what the effect, the result of that will be. There is some kind of magic involved in all of this, which if I have, must say, if I could conjure it at will, I'd do it every day. And here's an impossible question. Do you have a favorite score? Well, I don't really have a favorite among my own. My own, my own personality is such that I, first of all, I don't listen to the scores that I've done in the past, or very rarely unless I'm going to conduct them somewhere, because I'm always working on something on my desk at the moment. It's no particular comfort to pay too much attention to what I've done in the past. It's also my personality to be a little dissatisfied and more than a little in some cases with everything I've done so that I've used the analogy before that it's like having more than one child. In my case, I have three. Um, you love all of your children. We love them all equally. We, there are th aspects about each one that we're very proud of and perhaps aspects of each one that we wish we could improve and we try to do that. And that's certainly the way I feel about what, I've, what little I've been able to do in music. I mentioned earlier we live in the present. Certainly best to do that and put one step into the future and, and do better the next time if we can. <laughs> 